the alignment of the galaxy, Earth, and solar equators. And I have a beautiful animation of that right here. Look at that. Found it. So galactic equator, solar equator, Earth equator. And at a certain time, you see the 90 degree click. And that's a compression point. And to survive that compression, all structures will be tested. That's sort of the metaphor. Now, where I'd like to go in this conversation at this moment to try to finish one thought <laughs> um, is about time. Uh, just remember I showed Planck length, golden ratio equals hydrogen and all black holes. Uh, now we'd like to apply that to the study of time, which would be relevant to your interest in astrology, hopefully. You know the famous book, of course, The Spiral Calendar by Carolan. It's related to the prediction of the stock market by golden ratio, Prechter and Elliott wave. We wrote some equations. We think we can perfect that story, actually. You do a second order power spectrum, Sepstrom of the volume analysis and look for golden ratio. <laughs> Anyone who wants to play with that, we'll do some software. So the spiral calendar showed that you um, can take golden ratio as a pattern in time and predict when events emerge from chaos. And the key was golden ratio in time. Now, I subsequently wrote some new equations, very, very simple, but very, very powerful, to analyze the nature of coincidence. And I just want to point out how this fits what we're talking about at this moment. Goldenratio.com slash coincidence. And you'll see my very simple equations. It's an extension of, while we're having our conversation about things like Mayan calendar, in 2012, that I started with Joff Stray, who's a good friend, who analyzed the Mayan calendric for golden ratio and produced this chart based on golden ratio in time for the Mayan calendar, which was approximate and useful, but did not quite fit the Planck length, and we had fun conversations about this. So the Planck length, Planck energy, has a correlate called the Planck time constant which is a unit of time which defines sacred in physics, clearly. So physics is also very clear about what sacred time is. There is no subjectivity here. This is objective, serious, hard physics. So I took the equation, which I had already written, which we're using for reinventing a lot of hydrogen energy technologies, hopefully. The, what's called the palladium sputtering frequency. You know, palladium is dodecahedral and key to cold fusion. And the frequency at which it melts most efficiently <laughs> turns out to be the frequency Kansas found out was the best one to split hydrogen. It's called the Kansas hydrolysis. And the world's most famous scientist, Rustam Roy, got very excited. And he, we're playing together with his group in Pennsylvania and believe they'll be doing a lot of reinventing of hydrolysis. Because if you know the musical key signature to ring hydrogen at, then you can obviously reduce the, the power required. And that's called uh, nonlinear hydrolysis, perhaps. And, but where I went with this was to say, oh, look, that frequency for palladium and hydrogen is my new equation, Planck time times golden ratio equals the frequency of hydrogen. <laughs> Not just this, the radii of hydrogen, Planck length times golden ratio, but Planck, Planck time times golden ratio equals the frequency of hydrogen. Now, I'm, I'm giving you my reason for having this discussion at this moment is to suggest to you the very, very solid physics behind the concept of fractality in time. That's where I'm going with this. And, the, and my reason for saying that to you is that if you actually understood that all wave system, only all wave system, only self-organize when they're golden ratio fractal, period. Space, time, energy. They all must look like a rose, or they stay in chaos. <laughs> and now we're discussing time. So for example, you'd like miracles and angels in your life. Hello, I'd like miracles and angels in my life. Well, then you need to rearrange your time <coughs> into a fractal. And that would then define synchronicity in miracles, because as even uh, edu Education of <coughs> Soul 7, Jane Roberts, the ability to transfer charge in time depends, I mean, 
Yes, the ability to transfer energy information and charge in time depends on that fractality. That's how charge transfer happens, and that's called miracles, synchronicity, multiply connected topologies. All of that is idealized by golden ratio fractality, and now I'm going to show you the proof. Okay? So I took this equation for the timing of hydrogen, and I made the frequencies <laughs> for phase conjugate dielectrics that I used to create fermentation and the electric field to cause all of growth. I took that equation. Now, I'm not going to show you those actual frequencies because the people working with me would like to earn some money someday. <laughs> but anyway, I took this equation and made the frequencies to make phase conjugate dielectric resins. I just take piezoelectric oscillators and I ring a resins at the moment of crystallization and I make growth. We're going to talk about this later. I made the electric field to cause life using that recipe. I did it. It works. We, the PhD chemists measured 50% fermentation rate. We know why your compost co pile gets hotter when you put it where the magnetic lines cross, and now we know how to perfect that. We know why Stonehenge causes seeds to germinate. We know why it's a fractal field. At any rate, I only bring that we're going to talk more about the technologies later, but I then took that equation, this is the photon belt, all these golden spirals in time stories. I took that equation and Planck time times golden ratio equals the solar year. Planck time, the Planck time constant, the amount of time which is sacred to all of physics, the Planck time constant, the Planck time constant. Well, so the Planck length is 1.61 times 10 to the 33 centimeters. The Planck time constant is 1.35125 times 10 to the minus 43 seconds. The Planck time, the, in other words, sacred, sacred physics time, Planck time. Times golden ratio equals hydrogen, equals the solar year, and equals the Venus year. Precisely. Or, or so, so precisely within like one hundredth of a power. And so here is a picture of the Venus year. Oh, what does the Venus year look like? This is the, <laughs> this is the <laughs> orbit of Venus. There you have the orbit of Venus. Osiris is returning. He's going to live in that plasma field. Do you know why he's going to live in that plasma field? Venus rising, morning star. If you read, now later this afternoon we're going to talk about Uras and the story of the returning dragon Anunnaki and the history of DNA. Well, at the end of that story you have uh, Anton Park's last book, which is called The Testimony of the Virgin, in which she's trying to reconstitute the body of Enki, Osiris, returning. And where is, he, where is she going to stick him? <laughs> right there. And you know why? Because <laughs> that's the shape of the plasma field, which makes it inhabitable, a living body. Okay. And the top-down view of that is pent. Repent and be saved, says the Baptist minister. <laughs> <laughs> yes, go ahead. Could you say the first part of your question a little louder so they hear it? Uh, from an essentialist point of view, you know, there's uh, the idea that actually we're expanding into our consciousness, expanding into the different dimensions, the different dimensions, and upwards. And for how does Dan's work to do the ratio correlate to the dimension? Um, what we're saying that the number of dimensions you live in is this number of axes of charge rotation superposed in your DNA. That would be a simplistic. So this afternoon's, the way we start this afternoon is to describe the recursive braiding in your DNA electrically 
measurably responds to human bliss. You make golden ratio in your aura, your DNA implodes, it braids recursively, gets thicker, and becomes like a donut. This is where we're going this afternoon. And so your DNA, by embedding longer and longer wavelengths in the recursive braiding process, see that's, that's recursive braiding. Notice how fractal that is. So your DNA is a slinky. Where's my slinky? Oh, thank you. <laughs> so your, your DNA is a helix, and when it, in the presence of bliss or fractal electric fields called sacred, and that's very measurable, in the presence of that electricity, implosive, your DNA responds by recursively braiding thread to string to rope to fat rope. And when the phase ratio of the short wave to the long wave has phase discipline, then you get a soul. Then you have microchloridians in your blood, Anakin Skywalker. Then it's called boson seven in, in, uh, in uh, Montauk. You're, uh, you're a time traveler. What happens is your DNA embeds that phase relationship, starts imploding electrically. And that then eventually can accelerate charge to the speed of light in the core of the donut of your toroidal DNA, Lord of the Rings story. So this is a short version of our whole afternoon. We're done already. Oh, my God. <laughs> But here's the toroidal DNA. After recursively braiding, you see, the, the DNA palastrates and self re enters. And here's the photomicrographs of toroidal DNA. And it's seven sequential recursive braids that it get, when it gets that thick, making that tornado. And those seven sequential recursive braids, thread to string to rope to fat rope, seven times, that's called boson seven or the seventh seal, seventh sign, seventh veil, and I lost my slide. <laughs> this is the, the opening of the seventh seal, the seven gates. And they're codified by the seven spin axes, the tetrahedra, which is how DNA braids, and we wanted to tell that story this afternoon. So, to finish your question, going into the next dimension is when you become part of a longer wavelength electric field because another axis of charge rotating is superposed in your plasma, mostly because of what your DNA just did. And that shows up in the harmonic analysis or power spectra. Here is the power spectrum of EKG at the moment of love. We're going to play with tomorrow morning. This is my invention, the heart tuner. And here's measuring the response of DNA to coherent EKG, the effect of love on your genes. This is the measurement. So your DNA goes, sucks up all that beautiful electricity by imploding, recursively braiding. This is the way it's measured. Glenn Ryan did this at my suggestion. Measured the amount of the enzyme associated with the zipper of the braiding process. And so the, the, the amount, the thickening, <laughs> the plot thickens, Mr. Einstein. So the thickening process, the recursive braiding, is measurable by the increase of the enzyme that holds it together during the braiding process. If you measure that enzyme in the presence of love, DNA says, oh, I just braided because I felt that. And so this increase in the number of harmonics present in your electrocardiogram, what we're going to do together tomorrow morning with you, is called ascension because the number of harmonics inclusive ascend. Harmonic inclusiveness defines vitality in medical studies on heart rate variability. Harmonic inclusiveness is optimized by fractality and golden ratio. And medicine is called the healthy heart is a fractal heart. And therefore, get fractal or get dead. <laughs> no, and so the, the number of harmonics present show the number of axes of rotating charge that have been superposed, and therefore how many dimensions you live in. Sort of the physics of the Sedona bumper sticker, ascend already, we need the space. <laughs> Except when you turn blue. It, the, the, the turning blue is the charge radiance, initially ultraviolet, which is triggered by charge implosion. The compression allows the charge radiance. Another way of saying that in the way a biophysicist would s discuss subcellular metabolism is that high quality ultraviolet light is the motor of all cellular mechanics. And when you make that high quality light, think of it as sex juice. <laughs> If you find some place for it to go, the blue flash during good sex or menopause, 
Your plasma then can get projective, and that's called a body polis, the definition of the word politics. Was, was that an oxymoron? Wait, Let, let's, let's go back there. Good sex or menopause. That sounds like many... <laughs> sounds like military intelligence. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, the, the idea is, um, this, this is a theory of cancer that we wrote up, goldenmean.info slash cancer. You know that a cancer membrane is diagnosed to the extent that it, the cell is a sphere. If the cell is a sphere, you call that cancer. And cancer's other electrical definition is that contact does not inhibit replication. But now if a cell is a sphere, the membrane is harder, and therefore ultraviolet cannot go through, and therefore contact will not inhibit replication. For the same reason that a sphere is actually quite bad for architecture. It prevents charge projection. An egg is perfect. A sphere is a sin. For cell structure, for pine cone structure, and for people structure, and for architecture structure, a sphere is a sin. A sphere is a perfect container, but it inhibits distribution. So when the living cell is a sphere, the ultraviolet cannot get out. The membrane is harder. When the ultraviolet is stuck inside, that is what triggers premature replication, called cancer. For the same reason that a young girl that doesn't get taught dance and music has babies too soon. Same physics. So the creative juices need a place to go, and the creative juices is the coherent ultraviolet, is the stuff of love juice. Ultraviolet, the blue fire, blue flame, is the love juice at the cellular level and at the tantra level, in both cases. That's right. For the same reason you have the indigo kids. In blue light in meditation? Or? Yes, and the blue light special at a cheap restaurant. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> indeed, the, the, the blue plate special, excuse me. No, but, but the, uh, in meditation, indeed. And, but that's why we mention menopause, because you see, if your body does not have to make eggs all the time, there's extra blue flame available. So it, it doesn't, you know, it means when you go to your doctor and say, I'm having a blue flash, I think it's menopause, and he says, I think you need a pill. <laughs> Actually, it, it, it's, it's, because, it's because your doctor does not know something that your DNA does know, which is that it's fatal to be stuck below the speed of light. It is. It's absolutely fatal to be stuck below the speed of light. And your plasma's way of getting through the speed of light is to squirt its polis, its plasma, through the blue flame, ultraviolet, high frequency coherence, eventually through the speed of light. And that's your way to accelerate, and that's called immortality. That's where we're going with this physics. So actually, when you have that blue flame, the idea is not to take a pill, but the, rather to do something with it. If you're in a metal building, it'll probably drive you crazy. But if you're in nature, you might be able to sail. And those wings are called... Um, that infinity walk we talked about, you know, um, you put a figure eight, we did this before, but for those who weren't here, if I visualize there's a figure eight around me very accurately, and if I keep my eyes on the center of that eight, and I walk with a cross crawl like this around my large figure eight, notice at this point I change direction. And that's the point that I was forced to do a radical change of blood flow in my brain. So as I do this, I feel, see that change right there, that change of direction right there? So as I do this, I feel my corpus callosum getting very hot, right? So I can feel right now that this is warmer right here. As I phase conjugated and compressed the blood flow there, and that, that exercise called infinity walk is a solution to dyslexia in the book by that title. The reason we discuss it here is because it illustrates the physics of how phase conjugation causes perception. And we want to start there in this segment because we're, in this segment we're going to take the details of why the two pine cones crossing here, the two half hemispheres, the two pine cones cross, and when the two pine cones kiss, the plasma between them implodes and creates a centripetal force. Remember, that's the cause of perception 
gravity, life force, color, alphabet, and time. A very important thing. Does that have to do with pineal The pineal gland is right above that cross point, and it's there to implode the juices in the perpendicular axis. Because if you look at the physics of actual phase conjugation and optics, phase conjugate optics is actually four opposing light cones looking approximately like So if you draw a picture of how phase conjugation is done with lasers to create self-organization, it looks like that. So you've got the two hemispheres of the brain doing this, and your pineal is sitting here looking like that. <laughs> and the reason that's all working is because it's causing the plasma to become centripetal. Now, later today, when we get into talking about the psychology of this, we're going to remember we're going to conclude with a ritual of Inanna telling us how to go into the underworld. <laughs> and we're sitting there saying, what does that mean, really? It means being awake in a dream, but what does that mean, really? Mm -hmm. It means, where does the plasma go after it's projected and imploded and it's distributed as charge? And if you can do that well, remain awake in a dream, you will take memory through death. That is the only possible path to the sustainability of wave distribution called immortality, literally. The only possible definition of sustainability, and since the only possible stabilizers of all wave function, it is the only possible definition of peace. And forgiveness. So since it's the only way all any wave function can become self-organized and stabilized, that centripetal force becomes the only definition of peacemaking, and the only definition of forgiveness, perfect embedding, yes? So if you're going to understand the psychology we're going to do later in the day, you need to get the science we're doing right now. So please hang with me for a few more minutes on the science. I estimate another 45 minutes of core science. Then it's a free-for-all. Let's talk about whatever you think. We can have fun together and just play and relax and play with this. But please stay with me for the core science. And the core science is... Since I am suggesting to you that what happens between these two pine cones right there is the reason perception, life force, and gravity exist, that centripetal force, you need to know why there is centripetal force implosion there. If you understand why for yourself, then the rest of this all makes sense. So right now, at this moment, I'm going to try to show you why that makes forces centripetal. Yeah, the, the simple, it's, it's more than the science of gravity, it's the science of all self-organization. So remember, we're talking about we're talking about the top-down view of the pine cone and DNA and every living protein and the top-down view of Earth grid, zodiac, and universe. So DNA, Earth grid, zodiac, universe, and every living protein, this is a top-down view. And this is called phase conjugation, and this is called fractal, and this is 10 spirals of the golden mean. And this is waves crossing in golden mean ratio. That's what that is. And why does that become centripetal? That's the essential question. Therefore, become the only reason that gravity exists, not to mention life. That's the question we're looking at now. Now, to know how, how that works and why, you need to know the most important thing that screwed up poor Mr. Einstein. Remember, Einstein knew that infinite compression was the solution to everything. But no one told him that the golden ratio solves wave interference. And no one told him what a fractal was. That's why Einstein was a screw-up, basically. Poor guy, I'm not picking on him, the other one. But it's, it's really rather embarrassing that today physics has no clue why an object falls to the ground and no clue what electric field makes life. That's disgusting. Frankly, it's embarrassing. It it's, doesn't take, you know, a five-year-old can figure it out. And so really, Mr. Einstein, in today's physics, the fact that physics does not know that this is the only solution to wave interference and therefore compression is the reason that physics does not know this is the cause of gravity and life. 
That is embarrassing. It's why our planet is retrograde, I mean, in terms of conscious evolution, because we didn't figure that out. Einstein knew infinite compression would solve all his problems, but he didn't have a clue how infinite compression worked. And the reason he didn't know was he didn't know that this ratio among waves made wave interference most constructive. And you can prove that in a simple equation like this. You just add and multiply waves in a nonlinear medium. And if, if the waves add and multiply in golden mean, you get infinite, you get most constructive wave interference. If they add and multiply in powers of two octaves, you get most destructive wave interference. Simple, easy physics. So when your physics teacher doesn't know why an object falls to the ground, it's because your physics teacher didn't realize that this was the solution to wave interference, and therefore the solution to compression. Remember, the solution to compression is the history of computing, the history of life, the history of gravity, the history of the unified field. It's all about the solution to compression. It is the solution to how to die well, literally. So let's study the solution to compression, because we might get it. OK, here's where we are. So the reason that this allows waves to interfere most con constructively is because this golden mean ratio, any two numbers in the sequence added, equals the next number. That's called arithmetic progression. Add any two numbers, you'll get the next number, and you can do that forever. But also, in only this progression, you can take any number in the series and multiply it by 1.618, and you will get the next number. For example, 0.618 times 1.618 equals 1.0, and 1.618 squared equals 2.618. So any number multiplied by 1.618 equals the next number infinitely. That's called a geometric progression. In other words, this progression is arithmetic and geometric. It both adds and multiplies. And when waves interfere recursively, called heterodyning, that's what they do. They add and multiply. That is the reason that that ratio solves wave interference. And that's what Einstein missed, and that is the core stupidity, and I use the word stupidity with emphasis, of modern physics is not to know that. And here is the actual proof that if you write a simple equation to cause waves to add and multiply, software equation, large number of adding and multiplying of waves by octaves, you produce destructive interference. Two and the square root of two is a ratio of a large number of waves interfering. This is a net power output. The octave produces max destructive interference, square root of two and two, whereas golden mean and square root of golden mean produce maximum constructive constructive wave interference. So all the geometries of the tetracube, seven arrows, the octave, they produce maximum destructive wave interference. Very good for isolating charge. So it's not evil. It simply means that that geometry prevents charge from being distributed. That's why the beehive stores a honey in a hex. All hex geometry isolates charge. Very useful in certain environments. In your house where you want secrets and privacy, a square, a cube, a hex is very good. But in all architecture and geometry and architecture of life, when you use the opposite, which is the pent golden ratio geometry, there you get charge distribution. No secrets, perfect sharing, effective distribution of the divine. So this is the problem of Einstein and modern physics, is they don't know this. That makes them stupid, honestly. Because when you know this, you now know the geometry of perfect compression. This can perfect wave interference is perfect compression. And perfect compression, as Einstein well stated, is the solution to the unified field. And now I'm going to show you how. <clears throat> well, first, it, you know, in the 3D animation of this, remember, we got two pine cones, like two lasers approaching from opposite direction, and the two pine cones kiss, and the plasma between them creates a zone in the plasma which is becoming centripetal. This is the part of your brain when you feel bliss, or the part of your body when you feel bliss, that starts to spit out mucus and self-organize and get young again. 
It's, it's literally the solution to immortality, quite literally. The title of our book, Implosion, Secret Science of Ecstasy and Immortality, yes? So we're talking about what's happening in the plasma in the center between the two pine cones. That's what we're discussing at this moment, which is the cause of all self-organizing forces and the only subject of this morning. So, the two pine cones meet, they cross right here, and this is the top-down view of the plasma where the two pine cones are getting screwed. <laughs> and it's, it's literally a screwing motion. And there's a certain handed direction to this as well. One side's more centripetal, the other side's more centrifugal. It's the key to yin and yang. So here's what the top-down view of that plasma looks like. We, we've looked at this many ways. Now, here's the core. This is why it becomes centripetal. Why implosion exists and therefore gravity and consciousness and life. When the waves meet, only the golden ratio allows them to add and multiply recursively, constructively. It's called heterodyne, recursive wave interference. And when they add and multiply constructively, infinitely, infinitely, um, they add and multiply not just the wave length, but also the wave velocity. I repeat, they add and multiply the wave velocity. In physics, it's called the phase velocity. That means that part of the charge that's in rotation, that's experiencing compression, part of the charge is experiencing the adding and multiplying of the wave speeds, and that's called acceleration. So some of the charge during compression experienced acceleration. In physics, that's called gravity. Any questions? So the reason gravity exists Remember, this is a top-down picture of hydrogen, for example, as well as DNA. And DNA, we know, makes a little black hole. Peter Garyev measured DNA. It's a little gravity-making black hole engine. Here's the top-down view. Part of the charge is adding and multiplying the phase velocities by golden ratio. And so there is an increase in speed of a portion of that charge accelerated through the speed of light at the center by multiples of the golden mean ratio times the speed of light. Where did the charge go? It went down a wormhole through the speed of light. And we know that uh, Professor Chow has me measured golden mean multiples times the speed of light. That's proof of this theorem, that where the charge went is golden mean ratio multiples times the speed of light. And those wormholes is where the charge goes in gravity. And that's why the charge has to go somewhere from the Earth to the sun and out. And when the moon gets in the way, <laughs> it gets messy, actually. <laughs> but we'll go there later. Is, is that like why the universe is expanding? Well, it explains why the universe is dodecahedral, because it needed golden ratio to make gravity. It explains why the universe is fractal. Um, but in that view, that the expansion of the universe would stop if it got fractal enough. So actually, I think the universe expanding model fails to understand the fractality in time. And I agree with the uh, uh, Dwayne Elgin theory of continuous creation and Arthur Young reflexive universe that s instead of seeing the biggest Big Bang, they kind of see a conti continuous donut thing, where the shape of the universe is a saddle shape on a donut based on a dodeca. That's right. Implosion solves the explosion. Yes. The, the other way of looking at it, again, ties up with Marla Wolf and Nelson Paramay in situ, but two directions always. Yes, These that's right. Flows of That's right. Going yeah. into a black hole, which is you know, this is halfway between two cups. Right. Yes. And you've got stuff coming out of the black hole, mm -hmm. which is creating the expanding universe. Mm -hmm. And yes.
the in breath matching the out, out breath, yes. And the lasers have to perfectly match or they don't conjugate. So that's the in breath and the out breath. The centripetal and centrifugal match. And if this is their match, you will get centripetal force. And that causes gravity in all self organization. And that's what we call consciousness. Consciousness means if you dissect the term con with shus, S C I O U S, with turning inside out, ness. And this is that. You see? which in the Vedas is called the ability to self-refer, defining consciousness, which we now know in physics, the definition of the golden mean spiral, optimized translation of vorticity means the only angle of non-destructive self-reentry, thus defining self-awareness. That's why you always have two versions discussed in any chemistry or generally, except for this area, versions regarded as something negative. That's right. That's right, when you start talking about implosion, scientists think, oh no, we don't want to implode that building. But, but they don't understand non-destructive compression where something more coherent comes out than went in. You see, the other physics of this is that in that center of that plasma, the implosive process means every wave that doesn't fit this nest is canceled when it gets to the compression maximum. Actually, the diameter of the radii here is related to Planck length and the fine structure constant, the center of the donut, as it were. The acceleration point through the speed of light called making the L, or phase shift, Elohim. Translation of vorticity optimized from the circle to the line, which is how you go from mass to energy, where mass is defined as rotating charge, and the energy is defined as the linear motion of that same charge after it makes the golden mean spiral, which is hydrodynamics definition of golden mean spiral, optimized translation of vorticity from the circle to the line, the L. The psychology of this. This is our only moment of fundamental physics. We're going to move on from the fundamental physics. But to make the fundamental physics more friendly to physicists, let's start from the very beginning, as they said in The Sound of Music. <laughs> um, uh, in physics, 99.99% .99 of the uni universe is made of the stuff called plasma. Plasma is a cloud of electric charge. That cloud hangs together if there's something centripetal at, that ce at, at the center, which is called fractality, we now know. So that's what holds plasma together. Many modern physicists are now agree with the plasmauniverse.com and the Thunderbolt video series that the shape of giant interstellar plasma, if you draw them well, is the shape of all the ancient pictures of God. A lot of modern physicists are teaching that God is a cloud of plasma. And that actually is a pretty good introduction to God because these are self-organizing electric fields and you can steer them like tornadoes and if you inhabit plasma storms that big, <laughs> you get to be called yod he -Voh -He. Two cones, God, right? Yahweh. Right? And in my paper on plasma physics and the origin of the word Yahweh is goldenmean.info slash Yahweh if you're interested. Maybe we look at the pictures. Anywho, so if you are an electrical engineer and you want to know what our theory of the unified field is, and unified field th thinking is the point, because we need to be able to see what's happening in the plasma implosion in the center of our bodies to make gravity and affect stars. We know the solar winds, we're going to look at the chart later, the solar winds are dramatically affected when a million children sing at the same moment. Very measurable. If a million children sing the same song, the solar wind goes, ah. <laughs> that's happened many times. Actually, 13 times it was measured. So why does a million children singing the same song cause the solar wind to stop? Still point creation, where's the physics here? Why does focused human attention compress electrical charge? Bill Tiller's work. Why does focused human attention reduce radioactivity measurably? Yuri Geller's measurements. This is because focused human attention is an implosively centripetal phase conjugate or fractal plasma field. The two pine cones of plasma, remember your two halves of your brain are phase conjugating. The two pine cones kiss. There's plasma between the two cones approaching and that plasma starts to implode and becomes centripetal. The key to all the physics and spirituality mystery is right there in how did the plasma between the two pine cones kissing get centripetal at that center? That's what we're here to understand this morning. 
And the point we're making to introduce that beautiful issue is to understand how powerful plasma is. How could it be that the plasma sucking implosively at the center of your pineal gland sucks in every bandwidth, everything in physics? It's electromagnetic, it's gravitational, it's infrared, it's ultraviolet, it's all of the above. How could it be all of the above? The answer is simple and clear. Phase conjugation by golden ratio definition is inherently broad spectral. I will repeat. Phase conjugation, fractal implosion, is inherently, by golden ratio definition, broad spectral. That means golden ratio is the only ratio that can theoretically allow an infinite number of waves in finite number of waves to converge at one point. Have I made my point? It would be pointless otherwise. <laughs> so, so, so this is the idea that that geometry creates a centripetal force and so you can take control of everything that physics knows about, quite literally, when your biologic plasma implodes and phase conjugates. That is actually the point. So to make that statement real, this is, remember, this is a class for electrical engineers now, <laughs> my profession, supposedly. So in electrical engineering terms, that means what is plasma? 99.99% of the universe. What is plasma made of? A cloud of charge. And you should ask me, what is charge? You should ask me that. And I, charge. Well, thank you. Thank you <laughs> for asking the right question. <laughs> uh, charge. The universe is made of one compressible material. Understand that and you're in business. And that compressible, imagine waves traveling in jello. It's called the ether. And when the ether, the compressible material, is compressed versus rarefied, compression versus rarefaction, that's called plus and minus charge otherwise known as yin or yang. So one is more centripetal or more, one more centrifugal. So when those waves of charge rotate, it stores inertia, and that's called mass, like a gyroscope. And the timing, the period of that rotation, is our only definition of time. So rotating charge defines mass and time, simple and clear. And therefore, fractality and time allows charge transfer. So if you want miracles, study that. And that's, what, that's our next subject here. But just, just before we finish here, so this rotating system of compressible material called charge now um, means that the universe is basically one contiguous, and this is the picture for today. Look, different wavelengths of charge is everything that physics talks about, from radio waves the size of planets to gamma rays the size of atomic nuclei. And notice that visible, invisible, microwave, ultraviolet, it's all one wave. Oh, does that look like a caduceus? <laughs> Maybe we're getting there. Okay. So the only thing that did not used to fit this chart, Nassim showed the strong nuclear and weak nuclear are part of this chart. And now I have shown that gravity is part of this chart. When charge waves add and multiply using golden ratio, their phase velocity, charge is accelerated. And that's how fractality causes gravity when golden ratio is present, because the phase velocities add and multiply. We're going to talk more about that. But that's, so now you can see it's very real to say that I am a wave made of charge. Say that. I am a wave made of charge. <laughs> I'm a wave made of charge. What is the role of mind among waves? <laughs> I am a wave waving. <laughs> Am I a microwave? <laughs> so, so, so once you get comfortable with the idea that you're a packet made of waves, then you can throw your weight around. You need to be able to make centripetal force and steer tornadoes as a wave. That's the goal. So essentially, the plasma field around your body is this, and you're going to make centripetal force and become a gravity maker, and then you get to throw your weight around. That's called self-empowerment. Questions? Yeah, well, this is uh, highly relevant. Yes, and the Vibhuti analyze had some gold powder analog. <laughs> and we'll go there later in the conversation. But it sounds, well, the point I'm trying to make is that if you... Manifestation. Yes, yeah. that's right. Manif that, that creation is the compression of charge, and when charge is compressed to store rotation, it's called mass. And compression only happens 
in a fractal. Okay? Yes? So given that we've, uh, we've just gone through a period of over a year without solid layers, um, although we are coming up to solid maximum, which we've done in the trial, but there's been an increase in gamma radiation on the planet. How does that equate with charge? Like, two stars has been the Um. We were going to do our uh, celestial history story a little later, but this is fun. It's very, very fun. We can play with that now. Um, the question is about the solar maxima. Um, Jenny has mentioned that in the last year, with the solar winds being down, we've been doused with gamma rays in the solar system. And um, mo the larger picture, perhaps more significant, I believe, is that the whole last 11-year solar cycle was canceled. You know, they canceled George Bush's war because nobody came. Well, somebody canceled the last solar max. <laughs> and, um, you know, you give a war and nobody comes, it gets boring. <laughs> so, so, no, but the, the last solar maximum was canceled. And any solar scientist will tell you that, um, that um, if, if, a, if the 11-year solar max is canceled, presumably due to lack of interest, although we're not sure, um, <laughs> Um, then the next solar max will be a killer. It's very, very conventional. So any solar scientist will tell you when one solar maximum is canceled, you got a duck. <laughs> very simple. And the next solar max is scheduled for 2011. It's clear. The one that was canceled was 1999 to 2000. So however you do the shtick, you know that the sun's about to burp big time. Very conventional. And probably that solar max will be life-threatening the conventional physics is that the angle of the magnetopause, which is a lens that directs the angle of the approaching solar flare winds, and the magnetopause is determined by the geometry of the mass of the, of the greatest planets, Uranus, Jupiter, Saturn, at the time, that functions as a lens to steer the solar max. And, and this is called the Carrington event, which is when the solar event becomes basically plasmically threatening. Pla Carrington events clearly will very likely toast virtually every transformer on planet Earth for starters. Um, well that essentially means, since the power companies are too stupid to line up a, you know, one full set of spare transformers, that it's going to take them 6 to 24 months to build that many, because they forgot how to build that many that fast, honestly. So you can pretty much plan on being without power for, it's highly likely for many months, and that's just for starters, aside from high winds and a few other problems. <laughs> now. The, the thing that, um, that Jenny is pointing to, which is the saturation with gamma rays. Gamma rays are the higher frequencies. Notice, you see this chart penetrates the Earth's atmosphere. Yes, no, yes, no. <laughs> she loves me, she loves me not. This one doesn't love me. No, th this, this means the gamma rays don't normally go through the Earth's atmosphere. However, when they get really strong, <laughs> look out, you could get toasted. Um, this, the, the sort of science that I would turn to to talk about Jenny's question, and I'm sure I can't answer it well, but I would turn to Paul LaViolette, Galactic Superwave. And Paul LaViolette has done a pretty good job of analyzing the physics of what was incorrectly called the photon cloud, which is actually the fact that the solar alignment with the galaxy core precipitates a dramatic increase in interstellar dust and gamma, which pres penetrate the solar system causing a rapidly rapid increase in the temperatures inside the solar system and an increase in the temperatures inside the planets which is now scaring the astrophysicists and being measured so yeah and the only thing that will not experience heat during that compression wave called the rapture is fractal <laughs> that's the only thing you can compress without making heat very simple so it, this, this is an introduction to our conversation for later, which is the magnetic map of your heart and your house and your bed and your garden and your town and your planet need to look like that rose. <laughs> this, is the, this is how to redesign the magnetic map of your bed and your house and your heart and your town and your... Can you show us how to do that? Can that's, you help us survive the coming chaos? The, you know, and that a, lot, a lot of what we do tomorrow is around that question, practical applications. And it starts with literally, do you know how to douse to feel the magnetic lines, and then do you know how to rearrange them to look like a rose so that they will invite compression instead of 
at, at the end of instead of, you put the fundamental Christian book, The Left Behind. <laughs> Will you survive the rapture? <laughs> Do not be left behind. <laughs> Uh, the, the question was. It's called unconditional love. Yeah, uh, let's be romantic here, please. By all means, romance is good. Uh, in my view, and our little joke was, love is long wave phi ratio, or lo fi means to embed. So non-destructive embedding. This is a term they use in Playboy magazine. Non-destructive <laughs> embedding. <laughs> right. Uh, um, Non-destructive embedding is this uh, ability of the little wave to fit non-destructively inside the big wave. If you're doing a chart on how to do feng shui, they start with this kind of picture, how the little fits in the big. But the physics of how little waves fit in big waves non-destructively is perfected by golden mean ratio. So in, you know, let's go somewhere practical with that thought. Um, I believe this means that to love unconditionally actually means to embed your plasma in those structures which add inertia to embedding in general. In other words, do not fall in love with a steel building because that is an electric field that cannot be compressed and therefore it's going to be toasted like any metal trailer park when a decent tornado comes to town. It's the first thing to go because the tornado knows the definition of pain. So and that's the same way with falling in love with people who have so many issues that, you know, you can't get compression there. <laughs> There's no good squeezing. <laughs> so so being, being able to identify which that which is compressible is the issue. So non-destructive embedding, long wave phi ratio, you know, God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, describes a very specific physics of perfectible embedding which is a correlate to the physics of the principle of the divine, which simply means that charge distribution, which is perfect and infinite, or fractal, or shion, science, to branch, shion, or to be eon, ion, john, a chip off the old block, or I am that I am, or as above, so below. These are all only names for the physics of fractality, in my view. Yes, other questions? Well, let me check my calendar. I, I know that the end of the world, if you get the timing right, it's good for your credit cards. I'm looking forward to that one. Oh, good. No. Right. Uh, well, um, I do not have an exact date. My, my, study, my study suggests that we will begin to have climax solar winds kind of event late this year. Well, we'll begin to have, you know, planetarily uh, significant solar wind events late this year, climaxing late next year. So my prediction would be beginning September to October of this year, and then through, through following to one year from then is probably the most uh, uh, life-threatening kinds of events would be my, so one to two years at most from now would be my hypothesis. And, and a, grand a grand cross is a very good um, introduction and analog to this, uh, this physics. Um, even the conventional people who are studying this, they call this the erection of the Holy Cross. And um, there's a, a visual here. This is the galactic solar and earth equator. It's one example of a gra grand cross. And it's true that uh, at the, uh, the next year, um, the galactic equator, the solar equator, and the earth equator nutate and precess to a grand cross, which in astrology would be considered uh, highly stressful. And we now know the physics because a 90 degree angle produces maximum destructive interference. Um, which is the physics of feng shui, actually. The right corner is evil, but now we know the physics because that angle produces waves 
that cannot add and multiply, so maximum destructive interference. If that angle were 72 degrees, you get golden ratio in the opposite. You get beautiful compression. So this grand cross then applies to the, the stresses on the solar system with respect to major planetary alignments, the grand cross you refer to. In that, in that case, by the way, that was animation of what Nick Fiorenza calls the erection of the Holy Cross, and he has been working to model the, and for example, in, I think it was City of Revelation, he showed that if you take the pyramid inch, megalithic yard, Roman pace, da da da, English yard, eh, Roman foot, something, a whole list of all the ancient sacred metrology, all the dimensions of the ancients. The cascade fit a golden ratio cascade. Oh, how pretty. <laughs> Very pretty. But then poor John, poor, poor John, who didn't really understand any physics, I don't think, I'm not picking on the poor guy, but he, see, he's trying to make his case. He is British. Oh, that guy is British. Stiff upper lip and all. He, his bumper sticker was, abuse your body while you still can. <laughs> uh, uh, Roger Green visited him just months before he died, and he was able to consume whiskey to him under his table. I mean, they just, <laughs> it was really great. But, uh, so, no, but John was really cool. And we tried to get him in a Sufi dance in my barn loft in western New York, and, you know, oh, we're British. We only hug our dogs and our horses. Thank you. I'm kidding. I'm picking on everybody. But, but. P p poor John, you see, he is trying to make one simple, simple case. He is trying to say, the British are important. <laughs> and therefore, and therefore, the meter is bullshit. I mean, it's evil. <laughs> so his whole book is about the fact that the meter, the centimeter and the meter, are evil. And you know what? He's right. He is right. But the reason he gives is wrong. He says, oh, well, I got this cascade here. I got the Roman pace, megalithic yard, pyramid inch, and, and the English yard, and the Roman foot. And I had this whole beautiful cascade of every ancient sacred unit, all fits golden ratio, and the meter doesn't fit. Therefore, we British are sacred, and you guys using the meter are evil. <laughs> and you see, if he had known one simple thing, this, the plot length, he could have actually made his case, but he didn't. So he didn't finish making his point. And you know what? This is how waves make a point. Have I made my point? It would be pointless otherwise. Yes, go ahead. That's very close to the goal of isn't it? Well, <laughs> and, and you know, at the conclusion, at the conclusion of, of uh, Nassim Haramin's presentation to the Calgary group, and he says, oh, and the Planck length itself, 1.616 times 10 to the minus 33 centimeters, 1.618, 1, that sounds like golden mean. Wait, that's scale, that's not ratio. Wait, scale is ratio. Ooh, it's getting so profound in here we can't stand it. That means everything's relative. Oops. Do you <laughs> Even think they've mismeasured it, it is the golden ratio? Well, you see, <laughs> that question might be a little too deep for this discussion. But the way you derive the, <clears throat> the Planck conditions you take a simultaneous dimensional solution of the <clears throat> fundamentally occurring natural constants, the gravitational constant, the speed of light, and Planck energy constant, and you do an analysis in which you see in what unit of dimension could all three be expressed, called simultaneous dimensional solution, where you actually solve the equation based simply on the units of dimension. And when you do that, you derive Planck length, Planck time, and of course Planck energy. So it is the only unit in which all three constants can be expressed simultaneously. Now, uh, but if you actually look at what that means, it could, it could mean that the only definition we have of scale is ratio. And that's too scary for most physicists. But what any physicist will say is there is no more fundamental unit of scale. And what any mathematician will say was there's no more fundamental unit of ratio. Oops. <laughs> well, that would be a great thing for you to discover. <laughs> well, I wrote a paper on that about 20 years ago, actually, on that question. Uh, Goldenmean.info slash prediction. But, um, so, so Nassim was just catching up now. But actually, the thing, what we really need to do is invent a new unit of dimension based on Planck length. Now, this actually this is very, very practical. You know, at the end of today and tomorrow, uh, we're going to go into how you put these into practice.
And by the way, I said I do an outline of what we're doing to finish that outline. I finished today. Tomorrow's outline in the morning, biofeedback, heart <coughs> harmonics, brainwave harmonics, and you get a chance to try it, hopefully, or whoever wants to, or we rotate and play around. So we do heart waves, brain waves, and have fun with, and see how golden ratio in brain waves, <laughs> and we're going to give a prize to anybody who makes golden ratio in their brain waves tomorrow. You get a free something or other. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, tomorrow afternoon is the conclusion of how do you put this into practice conversation. We discuss the hygiene, and a big part of that hygiene is the beautiful, fun, highly visual slideshows, pictorials of biologic architecture, geomancy, sacred architecture, geobiology, and we're working with people who are leaders in those fields around the world. So we got the best pictures. <laughs> so we conclude in a light note. But um, to finish this conversation then, um, you see that I took the Planck length times precisely powers of golden ratio, whole number powers of golden ratio, no, ze there's zero, 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 zero point. There's no possibility that this is an accident. There just cannot be. That a precise power of the golden ratio, 116, 17, 19, power of the golden ratio produces precisely the radii of hydrogen when multiplied by Planck length. No, that it cannot be an accident. The only explanation is hydrogen exists because of this shape, a golden ratio cascade. This is 0 0.6181, 1, 1.618, 2.618 golden ratio. This is the reason hydrogen exists, period. And this is how it makes the gravity. And this is how gravity is made in general. And this is the beginning of our evidence that electric fractality is the cause of gravity. And by the way, my, the title of my paper I presented in Buddhist, Budapest six years ago with Nassim when we had the argument, before he got there about fractality, well, the title of my paper was Golden Ratio Fractality Causes Gravity. So I do make the humble claim of being the first to announce. <laughs> but anyway. I, I, just, I don't want to be the one. So I'm, there's no question, so I'm sorry. But I think I very well. Uh, there's another guy called Marlow Wolf. Have you heard of Marlo? I have heard of, but I don't know very well. Okay, so there's the Vedas which say that Om, okay, Om is the, and Om for us, we don't know, is a, a scalar wave. It's, a, it's different. model of the electron and use scalar waves and solved it. Mm. And it's um, it's on Amazon if you want it, uh, Dan. Mm -hmm. But you'll find it absolutely fascinating because you were saying everything comes from electromagnetic mm -hmm. or like gravity comes from electromagnetic waves. Mm -hmm. And he intuited that everything comes from scalar waves. Well, you know, I would, in, in my opinion, the words scalar and torsional, which are very common in non- technical communities are a bad word for phase conjugation, and that the correct physics term would be phase conjugation. And to use ohm as an example, here, when you pronounce ah, uh, this is ah, uh, well this is, first, this is the power spectra in thousands, so this is 500 to 3,000 hertz, and this is the dB, and this is time. So if you say ah, uh, and then e, so with E, your, your tongue fills the center of your vocal cavity and cancels out the mid-range harmonics, E. This is literally the shape of your tongue. So this is A, E, O, U, um. This is OM. Pronounced carefully. And if you, and I, we actually do this in 3D real time with a spectrum analyzer in the Korean group, but this is the graph of the energy density versus time of a properly pronounced I. So clearly what's happened is you've initiated perfected compression by what's in physics, this is called perfect damping. It's also called phase conjugation. And that induced still point is the implosive point, Bindu point. And so the fact that he calls this scalar or torsional tells me he doesn't understand phase conjugation. Well, scalar in Marlow works is very, very simple. Yeah. Scalar just means non-vectorial. Well, you see, that's a actually, I think, unhelpful language, and not to pick on anyone here, but what's happening here is phase velocities are being accelerated between frequencies by ratio. 
And so some of the charge under that compression has been converted from compression to acceleration. So I, I don't object to the term scalar or, or torsional, which are very common. However, most people who use those words do not understand phase conjugation or they use more accurate language. That's my I'll, thought. I'll try to keep silent about this, but I just want to say <laughs> one last thing. His model had um, scalar waves collapsing into sphere center. Yes. Doing a spherical rotation in the middle and bouncing back out. And where they crossed, they were a standing wave which created the electron. Well, but he never knew why they went to the center or came out of the center. And then Nassim comes along and says everything's a black hole. Well, that's, and I really like that model. And in fact, perfect collapse is precisely how I would describe this. So we're very close in that sense. We just tuned up the word scalar and made it more precise by using the word phase conjugate, or which is really the geometry of implosion, which is the core subject of this morning. So th that's, but so many people get stuck. They have this word scalar or torsional, and other people have the term orgone. And they're stuck in a word that has no definition in physics. And many people who use the word orgone are, like James DeMeo, are totally stubborn <laughs> and unwilling to see that a phase conjugate dielectric is what's called orgone. But yet, electrical engineers can talk about it if you use the right language. And that's one of the reasons why we're here. But I love that language of a, you know, and this is what we animated right here, is that that geometry of compression of 12 cones to center, which is the 12 cones of this model, which it, I'd, I'd love to compare that to his animation. That's beautiful, and I appreciate that language. It's uh, quantum matter dot com. Uh -huh. But do you see why the, the properly pronounced ohm you can actually determine by spectrum analysis if you did it right? And you are creating a still point, which is literally implosion point. But you see the Tibetan multi timbral choir. <laughs> so that ability to relax and get the phase transition points at the exact correct timing is what determines if you made the precise caduceus to create implosion correctly to phase conjugate. Could you say that again, quantum? I think it's quantum matter dot com. Quantum matter dot com. Two M's? Yeah. Let's just see for fun here. No, that's helpful. His name is Wolf, right? Oh, yeah, Ma Milo Wolf. Thank you. No, that's fun. That's very relevant, and I like that model. So he and I could have a fun conversation about his definition of scalar versus my definition of phase conjugation. Yeah. Oh, I see. I see. That's I see. OK. Well, thank you. And it's great that you've been studying this stuff. By the way, Saul here is one of the core, shall we say, activists of the local Byron New Energy Group. And they're doing lots of really cool work on creating nonlinear energy technologies and experimental magnetic motors. And I'm pleased and excited to begin more collaboration with that group. And we're cooking up more fun right here in Byron. And our host here in Byron, Noah, many of you saw his name on our poster. Noah is one of the organizers of Byron New Energy also. So you're act and Saul here is actually building an experimental magnetic motor called the Steorn right now, which was the most recent meeting. And we're going to talk a little bit about phase conjugating magnetics and our technology later as we proceed here. So thank you for being here, sir. Yes. Um, the conversation we were having, now remember, we've decided we're going to try to get very focused and understand a core principle here. That's where we're going here. That where we left the, that conversation was we figured out that hydrogen looks like that. And here's the equation. And this agrees nicely with Nassim Haramin that everything's a black hole, especially hydrogen. Another way of saying this is to say that um, in the atomic table, the reason that atoms are able to make gravity is only because their nucleus is fractal to their electrons. And my new equation for hydrogen is part of that proof, as well as Nassim's new equation for the mass of the proton, proving it's a golden ratio black hole. So that gives us new way to understand the work by the chemist Moon, University of Chicago, very famous, who provided rather extensive evidence that the geometry of the nucleus, protons, neutrons, called the hadrons, the way they nest in the nucleus for the whole atomic table was tetra, cube, octa, ecosa. Star tetra, cube, octa, ecosa. So what's the ecosa on the outside? Hello, that is actually the name for this. 
That's what that is. This is that. And now my proof is that the ratio among them is golden ratio, which is the ratio of dodecicosa dodecicosa 3D fractal here. So this is the only possible 3D fractal in my view, which is why DNA, Earth grid, Zodiac, Universe, and Hydrogen are this shape. <laughs> okay. So now that's the geometry of the nucleus. Here are the electrons, SPDF suborbital, 1357 donut pair, 2, 6, 10, 14 electrons. That's the whole atomic table, S, P, D, and F. So the S suborbital is a donut, two vortex, very simple. That's the, and this is the physics of what the S suborbital looked like. And by the way, keep this picture in mind because later in this conversation, I want to explain to you what the shape of the plasma around your head looks like when you have bliss. These are the two hemispheres of your brain. One is centripetal, one centrifugal. And this is the phase conjugate perpendicular plane. So this is the plasma around your brain when you make golden ratio called ecstasy or bliss. And this explains why the two hemispheres of the brain are doing this. So if you do a walk like this, with this cross crawl, you eliminate dyslexia. It's phase conjugation perfected to create this compression point here. So keep this picture in mind. This is the two hemispheres of your brain. This is pointing toward the pineal, and the pineal is over here. The pineal gland, thank you for the pine cone, sir. <laughs> thank you. The, pine, the pineal is right over here between those two hemispheres saying, oh, oh, I think I feel phase conjugation coming. <laughs> and it's lit on fire. And I have felt that many times. That's why I talk fast. <laughs> so the, the SPDF suborbital is... Uh, two electrons, S suborbital, donut. Pi suborbital, this is the physics, tetra cube. Three vortex pair, very simple. You take three pairs of donuts, you got yourself a cube. <laughs> and that's called the pi suborbital. And the D and F suborbital, 10 and 14 electrons respectively. Five and seven vortex pair. The five, seven vortex pair are the Anu and Dodeki Kosa. And if you look then at the table in occult chemistry, later justified in today's modern physics by Phillips in England in his book, Psi Perception of Quarks, the electron shells look like this. Tetra, cube, octa, dodeci, cosa, they call this stars and bars. So here's our electron shells, tetra, cube, octa, Okay, so here are the electrons. Tetra cube octa equals dodeca. What did the protons look like? Tetra cube octa equals dodeca. What's that called? Fractal. What's the new proof? Golden ratio times Planck equals hydrogen and the atomic table. So this is rather overwhelming evidence that it is that fractality which induces what's called non-destructive charge collapse, implosive attraction of charge a fractal attractor, and that is the cause of gravity. And I don't mean subjectively, I mean objectively precise, precisely what Einstein never figured out, why an object falls to the ground, now you know. Now, I want to say more about that to make that sort of, this, this is our only moment of fundamental physics here. Did somebody have a question before we? The arc angles, yeah? Yes. Uh, sorry, I'm just cutting Um, about ultraviolet, about cell metabolism, or about menopause? What, would, what is I, not? I'd say pretty much everything. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can sum it up in a couple of sentences. I'd love to explain the menopause because it's very exciting. Go ahead. I went to my guru, I never had any experience, but I was quite young and I had my three kids, Osho, and Jadan, Sam, and I was orgasmic, I was orgasmic, and 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 I was orgasmic, Mm -hmm. 
No, it, 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 to really fly is the point. If you were clairvoyant and you looked at the arc angle of the projected plasma of a plasma body about to project, it looked like wings, literally, the two ends of the heart, the arc angle, the archon, that whole story. Um, so it's really true that your plasma body's final yearning is to achieve distribution. Very simple. That's why ancestors get stuck in the land. They didn't find a fractal enough place to become projective electrically. And that's sort of advanced physics. But we, we want to go back here a little bit for Richard. Um, we, we started this by saying the cell takes in food. Very simple. The food are relatively long wave. If you do biophysics, subcellular mechanics, you find out that the wavelengths of the proteins of food, the cell eventually converts into a shorter wave, a shorter wave. The steps are called adenosine dry type triphosphate, you can actually measure this, by, you can measure kundalini in that microwave, long story. But anyway, the cell takes the wavelengths and makes them shorter and shorter, refining until finally the climax of cell metabolism is where the food goes up a caduceus cascade into shorter bond lengths and produces the final product of the cell, which is high quality ultraviolet light, the blue fire, the blue flame. This is like the climax of cell metabolism, just like it's the climax of your orgasm, actually. Is that the, IGP? the adenosine triphosphate is the step function of the caduceus. Another way of saying it is that every time the cell needs to store and retrieve energy, it does it in a whole number of units of dollar bills, I mean wavelengths. And uh, so when you spectrum analyze for adenosine triphosphate on the spine, you can measure kundalini. You can replace every hospital scanner in 3D because you map the three-dimensional geometry of cellular metabolism, Bob Dratch, microwave emission scanning technologies, etc. So the physics of Kundalini is very clear, but that's another story. So the cell has now got this great ultraviolet light. It's sex juice. What's it going to do? I got this cool stuff, but it's too hot to handle. Playboy magazine 101, you know, too hot to handle. So, the high quality ultraviolet light has got to go somewhere. Now, if the cell has gotten stuck and is not sociable with its neighbors, it will then become spherical and the membrane becomes harder and the ultraviolet is stuck inside. That is the way cancer is triggered. The premature, because the ultraviolet goes to cell center and triggers replication. Because that's how replication is fired. Yes, yes dear. Yeah, but I mean, would you say that the young teenage girl who didn't have dance and music is selfish because she wanted to have a baby? That's right. Yeah, I wouldn't pick on the little girl. I'd try to help her. You know, <laughs> same thing with the ca cancer cell. It's not evil. It just didn't learn how to share very good, so it didn't get to have much fun. <laughs> That's right. Yes, shareability. Yes, good. So. Uh, the, uh, the plan B is, if the cell is, is egg-shaped by golden ratio, ideally, its plasma ultraviolet is projective, and then it's distributed to its neighbors, and during foreplay, tantra, and kundalini, the ultraviolet juice can gather at the tailbone. And if the tailbone, and this is our, we might as well have that discussion, this is the biology of kundalini 101, the Bentoff conversation, the biomechanics of kundalini, and this is my original expertise, and Bentoff was my mentor, um, the biomechanics of kundalini is that the tailbone becomes a sucker. <laughs> As we joke, the Scorpios love this conversation because we don't apologize for sting, we enjoy it. I'm a double Scorpio, my partner Valerie's a Scorpio, we can enjoy this conversation, we hope you enjoy sting. So the tailbone is a stinger and during kundalini the organ kunda buffer is a, um, the organ kunda buffer is a device which regulates the uncurling of the tailbone. And as the tailbone uncurls, which is related to the pelvic tilt, if you do this and then this, and your spine liquid pumps, it is now clinically impossible to be depressed if your spine liquid is pumping. Sacrocranial Physics 101, Upledger Institute. So the tailbone is now got a plug in it called the Kunda Buffer, <laughs> you know? And if you get that, Bloomin' plug unstuck from your tailbone, do it gently because it could explode. 
<laughs> but if you gently release the plug in your tailbone, your tailbone starts to suck. And the reason it sucks is because of the low frequencies of the heart, artery variability, which is your breath, form a caduceus called the sacrocranial tidal rhythms, which are measurable in the sacrocranial pump. And you can feel them. They're lower than your breath. And so that's called a peristalsic pump. And if, you're, if your spine liquid harmonics, the long tidal rhythms, as they're called, are in phase, then your spine can suck. And it sucks up that ultraviolet, along with the plasm, up the spine. And actually, it can suck the haploid DNA, sperm, minus the... Uh, prostatic liquid can also go up the spine. And you have an explosion of growth in the high brain. And the top of your head gets pointed, as did mine and other friends. And you uh, get, a, a, a Bentoff is here showing that there is an amperage that flows around this donut. Remember we talked about the two halves of the brain as a donut just minutes ago? So that amperage that flows fires up the homunculus, which is a map of the whole body and the brain surface, and you feel like lightning is going up your tailbone. And remember, this is all, we're talking about how ultraviolet is plumbed. This is a plumber's answer to your question, okay? So the ultraviolet plumbing has, has, has shot the tube, and this amperage flows, creating this circuit, and then there's a focus of a phonon wave at the pineal pituitary, the rider in the saddle, and the ventricle horns, liquids, are triggered sonically and they ring, and that's called getting horny, if you know Playboy magazine. And it it's, it's contains sexual juices, actually, it's true, and it's why Moses and Lucifer have horns, actually. It indicates the completion of the Kundalini circuit, and it's why the horns of an animal are so critical to its ventricle antenna function. And there's all kinds of microwave fun stuff happening here. So, yes? So, Dan, I do, I don't know much about meditation on nucleus. Meditation on the bottom end of my spine using violet color, will that help this Kundalini and ecstasy? Yes, um, the violet could be relevant, but I mean, tomorrow we're going through a whole series of hygiene suggestion involving live food, raw food, and yoga, and sacred gymnastic, and, and movement and being in highly charged environments where your body gets more fractal, but then eventually you learn the actual switch movements of breath and spine and pelvic tilt, all of which help that pump to go. I, I would strongly encourage people from personal experience, I say, do this gently, <laughs> because it is one of the most common ways to enter the insane asylum as well. <laughs> yes? That, well, there's a whole conversation about proof that the Catholic Church is evil is you can measure the uh, soil compaction next to the steeple. So, you know, not only do they put the microwave towers in all church steeples in Italy, but uh, you, even before they did that, you could measure the soil depth next to the steeple because it's the wrong kind of capacitor, actually. Whereas the kind of capacitor that works looks like an onion, the Eastern churches. So... Now, if you take those steeples and you put them in an array that makes a bigger body, you've got a chance. But generally, most church steeples, you can prove, cause death by simply measuring soil compaction in the soil next to the steeple, which is also a good way to sue your power company to remove the power pole on your land. Simply measure the soil compaction, very cheap to do, and that is proof that it's killed everything alive in the land. So it's a good way to remove Catholic churches and power tolls, poles. <laughs> Yes, other questions? Also, if you sensitive, you can go into the Catholic Church and immediately feel guilty, depressed, and bad health. Without having a Catholic upbringing to back And we could go into the astral hygiene issues, which actually we're going to talk about astral parasites tomorrow and show some pictures of it. But we don't need to go there right now. You know, these are just confused kids. We don't need to pick on them too much. Education is the key. That's where we're going with this. So um, let's see, where are we? we? So we had our conversation about ultraviolet. We got a little sidetracked from the core physics, which was, the core physics was simply the geometry of implosion. Now, I see it's almost 11.30. Um, we were going to take lunch about 1. Yes.
Well, you know, these have never been apparently detected from the center of the Milky Way before. The person who is The person who has made a career in science from analyzing interstellar pulse is again Paul Violette, his book Pulse of the Galaxy. He is saying that like the galactic pulsar that was within minutes of the giant Asian tsunami, um, that the geometry of the, the galactic pulsars are basically a radio telemetry system used by interstellar civilizations and he presents a lot of evidence. Uh, now, I won't comment on that one, but just tr tr try to get the general sense of why we talk about seven so much here. And again, I, I remind all of us that the difference between numerology and physics, both are pattern recognition. But the difference between numerology and physics is where you predict something a wave is going to do. I'm always having this conversation with Jane, who's wonderful. But the fact is, you can get confused unless you understand the only re reason to study patterns is to actually predict what waves are going to do. Mm -hmm. So now we knew that the seven air... Pardon? Because they've done them before, so you can... Because it's happened before, so you can do... Yes, or both. But yes, but the point is that the symmetry study, the pattern recognition, is only proven useful when you see something that waves are doing. Or you're right, you don't have to predict it. it when it illustrates, that's right. Yes, a pure principle of wave function. So what, we, what we're after is a pure principle of wave function. And numerology is only useful if it helps us there, actually. Okay. So now I'm going to illustrate the power of seven from that point of view. The electrical engineering reason is powerful. Remember, the layers of heart muscle, the seven layers of heart muscle are exactly the seven arrows to a tetrahedron. The Hebrew alphabet is the seven arrows to a tetrahedron. The sequence of the braid of DNA, the seven recursive braids, are the sequence of the seven arrows to a tetrahedron. Hieronymus Storm and the Anu and the seven phi spin of the Anu, which is the shape of the human heart, the heart of the sun, and the heart of hydrogen, and the heart of DNA. They all have seven spins outside and five spins inside. So I'm now going to show you why those seven spins. In DNA braiding, it's called the seventh sign, the seventh seal, opening the seventh seal. Well, that will happen once your DNA makes the seventh recursive braid because you start to implode, and then you become a gravity maker, and that is the seventh sign, and it's not a mystery. It's simple and beautiful physics. And also, in terms of just the most practical present example, the human heart muscle, here's, here's the Anu, the seven spins outside and the five spins inside. Here's the five. One, two, three, four, five spins inside, and the seven spins outside. We're going to look more tomorrow. This is the shape of the DNA braid, because there's five spins in the helix and seven spins in the braiding, and therefore also the shape of the center of hydrogen and the heart of the sun, and that's the visual I'm looking for right now. The solar heart is the shape of the Anu. Here's the slide, thank you. So when clairvoyants look at the heart of the sun, it's an organ of perception, and the only way out of here, they see that, Anu, seven spins, five spins. When they look at the heart of hydrogen, they see that, the same thing. This is from the book, Psi Perception of Quarks, Modern Physics. This is the heart of hydrogen, three Anu per quark. Yeah. And then when you look at the human heart, 
You see seven spins outside, five spins inside. And later we're going to see when we look at DNA, the story this afternoon, five spins in the helix. So I got a cube, three spins. The cube lifts up and rotates on a dodeca four. And then the, the dodeca ratchets down a helix, five axes of spin in the thread that is DNA. Five spins inside. Five axes of rotation superposed. Then I take that thread and braid the braid of the braid on the braid seven times. <laughs> and then I have a soul. I have the implosive. I have Lord of the Ring. Right? So all that is because if I look at the tetra, there are only seven arrows that pass through it. And it has more symmetry than any other sub any other shape. Four vertex face center and three edge center pair spin symmetry arrows, axes of symmetry. Seven arrows of the heart, Hieronymus Storm's famous book. So that's why seven is important because if you get seven donuts rotating superposed axes of spin in the tetra cube, then you create the perfect, actually you create the perfect container. The seven spins tetra cube is a perfect container. And the five spins, golden ratio, dodeca pen, is a perfect projector. And the Anu, the slip knot, has a perfect projector, five spins, held inside the perfect container, seven spins. And that's the Gordian slip knot. And that's an introduction to symmetry group theory in physics. And then as we advance in that discussion, just to sort of, because we are, we, one of our excuses for teaching is to call it sacred geometry, which is really wave function. Um, notice that each ball here of this model, each ball, the zone system, zonepool.com, Z-O-N-E, each ball has 26 holes. Check it out, it's kind of cool. The reason there's 26 holes in each ball, which is called 26 string theory physics, all of physics, 26 holes in every ball, is because seven arrows to the tetracubic array, here's the tetracubic side, and six pairs of axis of symmetry, one, two, three, four, five, six arrows to the dodeca ecosis symmetry. Six plus seven is one. Shall we begin? CNN is ready? CNN is ready. Great. <laughs> We're live. <laughs> well, thanks for your dedication, really, to come, everyone, and care so much and be interested that much. My name is Dan Winter. As you know, the website is fractalfield.com and goldenmean.info. I particularly want to acknowledge my partner, Valerie Sandaline, who everyone knows makes it possible for us to run around and get in so much trouble. Valerie is from Sweden and Paris. And she's also happy to help you with uh, DVDs and books back there. And please, everyone, whatever arrangement you made for registration, we sort it out with Valerie. Just be sure we're clear. Thank you so much. And I also want to thank Zakiron for filmmaking and organizing here. Thank you, sir. So. <clears throat> we're in beautiful Byron Bay, as our friends from South Africa who came all that way, my goodness. <laughs> um, and we're thinking of all the people in the rest of the world who are probably a little bit cold right now. And we'd like to tell you through the film that it's steamy here. <laughs> <laughs> this is not exactly what you call no sweat. If you relax perfectly, then it doesn't create heat. And that's the good introduction of the principle of what is a fractal. <laughs> when you relax perfectly, you get compression without heat. <laughs> and that is part of the metaphor of our day. So first, we will do a, a short outline of our agenda. Um, so this is a, an outline of the outline of the outline, which is very fractal. Um, first of all, the toilets are in the back, <laughs> just so you know. We're going to take a break for lunch. Uh, probably we'll do either an hour and 15 minutes or an hour and a half. We'll probably break around one, and uh, we'll talk about suggestions of where to go. There's places around. Um, since there's fewer places around tomorrow, you might want to consider bringing your own lunch. It's up to you or do a picnic here anyway. There's a little kitchen in the back, so people can play a bit if they wish. And Zakyron knows the arrangements here in the facility very well. If anybody has any facilities or area questions, thank you, Zakyron. Um, so the description of our agenda um, my idea was, while it's morning and we're fresh and it's not too terribly hot, we'd really get ambitious. And for, for starters, we will actually try to do the serious science. So the first you know, couple of hours, we will try to be fairly structured and actually outline in as disciplined a way as possible what I consider, what we consider to be the serious science, which is, in summary, 
What is the geometry? What is the shape that makes implosion and all centripetal forces possible? So the centripetal forces are consciousness, life force, gravity, color, perception. These phenomena in the universe which create apparent self-organization and apparent centripetal or implosive forces, they're all caused in this radical new model of physics, and I emphasize physics, um, by a simple singular geometry. Valerie, could you just grab the star mother for me? And uh, so that simple singular geometry is this stellated dodeca that creates the golden ratio in 3D, which we believe is literally precisely a map of everything from hydrogen, DNA, the galaxy, stars, and how photons make color, and how your brain creates perception. Literally, precisely, and we don't mean, you know, poetic metaphor. No, we mean serious, powerful, radical, new physics of all self-organizing unified field stuff. <laughs> so we're going to pretend to be a little bit ambitious and actually understand that. <laughs> so that's, that's our little plan, is that we uh, try to do the core science this morning. Then, then late morning or early afternoon, it's sort of the opposite of that. It's a relaxed free-for-all, let's introduce each other, let's talk about whatever you came here to talk about, free conversation, really. You know, so we want to, this, this is your time, and thank you for investing that time to join us. And so be sure to tell us what it is you want to talk about. Cool. You know? So we'll have that free time, really open conversation, late morning, early afternoon. And then <clears throat> afternoon today is planned the sort of <laughs> science of DNA followed by history of DNA story. <laughs> Why is DNA so popular in this galaxy? <laughs> and and uh, you know, how does it work mechanically that DNA creates soul, that plasma tornado through the center, the braiding process? Why is it that DNA actually physically responds electrically to the presence of human bliss? And what happens to DNA in that electric field of human bliss that makes soul and shamanic astral plasma projection possible and all that cool stuff. So we're going to look at the science of DNA early afternoon and then late afternoon today, as we're getting tired in the day, we do storytelling. And the storytelling is a short, brief, quote unquote, history of DNA, where we go into the, the, the stellar story of ancestor of DNA. And we may hopefully get a little time we're talking about the aboriginal story of origins. We have some experts in the room. Jenny is here, and Dave is here, and others, uh, have, and, uh, and Michael. And uh, so, and John, I'm sorry. And uh, so, uh, at the end of the day, closing that little history story, a sort of uh, shamanic recapitulation, could be a word for that, where, you know, at the end of your day, when you go to bed, if you can relax enough to remember your whole day in sequence, then um, if you can play your day as if it were a movie, Gurdjieff taught this, just before you sleep, if you can play that movie without interrupting it, that's very hard to do. <laughs> as you close your eyes, you can see if you play your day like it's a movie. As you can play the day like a movie without interrupting it, that means you've relaxed enough to process all the emotions and let it be. <laughs> In other words, you, the emotion has become shareable it's not going to distract you anymore. Everything there is shareable. It's been processed. Now you can go to sleep, and the collective mind can absorb that material. That's called shamanic recapitulation. It means you've digested your day. And we're going to talk about the physics of digestion as perfected compression. And that's what's happened is when the compression is perfect, the distribution happens, and so the karma is sorted, as they say after a fight in an Irish bar. Yes. Yes, that, that, that is our first, our very first slide here, dear, that, that this particular geometry, uh, one and only one geometry, and the model is here, the star, star mother, is the electric cause and mechanism, origin of gravity, life force, perception, bliss, it's origin of color, and we're going to explain uh, that it's the origin of time that time is also fractal for that reason. So that is the core science of today, is to try to make some sense of this in serious physics terms, but also gentle, playful terms that 
are available to the non-scientist. Yes, sir. If you really run them backwards, you'll read what you want to Yes, and if you, take, if you phase conjugate backwards, <laughs> a friend of mine was a phase conjugate optics guy at Roswell Park uh, Institute in Buffalo, New York, uh, Bob Zawada, really honor him. He taught me about phase conjugation. And when you called him, his answering machine says, well, please leave a message and I will phase conjugate back to you in the near past. <laughs> <laughs> yes, go ahead. Uh, how do you want to handle questions? As I'm sure we've all had lots of questions. Yes, questions. Um, what I'd like to suggest is for the first part today, we try to, try to stay a little bit on topic. So for the first couple of hours when we try to sort through the science, questions are invited, but hopefully a little bit on topic. But then later in the morning and after early afternoon, it's a free-for-all. We talk about whatever's fun. Okay? So questions are always invited, but for the first little segment, hopefully the questions are a little bit focused. That's all I'm asking. Yes? Go ahead. Well, I've got a question. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, Nassim Haramein is a great scientist that Dan knows very well. How does his singular fractal shape converge or simulate with yours? That, that's a wonderful question and, and not a bad way to get started. So uh, uh, let's play with it. Um, you know, Nassim Haramein, for people who don't know, the resonanceproject.org, he's doing some wonderful work with fundamental physics. and. Um, he was kind enough, he came and presented at both of our inter International Fundamental Physics Conference in Budapest, along with Elizabeth Rauscher and now Pat Flanagan's involved, and many international physicists, Richard Amoroso. And then uh, Nassim was a lead presenter at our most recent conference that sponsored this tour in Calgary, the Breakthrough-Technologies.com. And so we've had a lot of fun, and Nassim is very close to Valerie as well. Um, in the first Fundamental Physics Conference, of Budapest, there were events like people standing up and shooting the moon at other physicists and screaming <laughs> arguments, I will mention, gently. <laughs> I'm not going to mention any names, but it was extremely colorful. Uh, <laughs> and uh, for that, it was not the scene. That's it was not the scene. <laughs> but it was a very colorful event. Uh, uh, but screaming arguments are helpful. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and there have been some resolution, actually. And I will say, for example, at that conference, I had a discussion with Nassim in which I suggested that although the stellated tetrahedron is powerful, tetraoctet cube, he was using tetrahedral model, I suggested that's a bad model of what is fractality. And we had a, <laughs> we had our little, <laughs> about that, you know. But since then, it's gotten really beautiful. And let me tell you why. The reason I told Nassim that a tetrahedron extended which is how he starts all his videos, was a bad model of a fractal, is because if you stellate the tetrahedron, you know, tetraoctic cube, the cube green red thing in here, tetraoctic cube, you stellate the tetraoctic cube, you never get any golden ratio. What does stellate mean? Uh, if you extend the edges of the tetra straight out, you here's the tetra. Here we have the cube octa is a stellated tetra. All you have to do is extend edges of tetra straight out to cube octa. Tetra, octa, I'm sorry, cube octa, ecosa, dodeca, octa, tetra. Now, if you extend the edges of the tetra straight out, you get cube octa. Uh, however, at, there's nowhere in there with anything except the square root of two as ratio. And therefore, when the waves interfere in that geometry, you do not get constructive interference, and you do, do not get perfected compression. So I said in the seam, this stellated tetra, cube octa, tetra octa cube, it's all the same electrically. The tetra octa cube is not fractal, because you got golden ratio nowhere, and therefore, there's no compressibility. And compressibility is the key definition of fractal, in my humble opinion. <laughs> So, you know, we had a little, uh, little shtick about that. It was compressing it down. Well, that's the thing. But since that time, Nassim has beautifully agreed and emphasizes now that actually the path to superconductivity and compressibility, for example, when a DNA thread becomes superconductive and when a gold monofilament becomes superconductive or when Damien Brinkley got struck by lightning and had his near-death experience and his DNA became superconductive, what happens is the compression event, lightning through Daniel Brinkley's DNA, and that's a path. That path is called the jitterbug. I learned it personally from Buckminster Fuller. So that path from cube octa to ecosa, now suddenly 
Instead of this, all square root of 2, you have now e cos of dodeca, which is this, e cos. And at that point, you get golden ratio everywhere. And there's implosive path through center called superconductivity. And so now Nassim is, in fact, emphasizing the jitterbug as the mechanism, and we're in much more agreement and fractality. Plus, and I absolutely honor Nassim for this, I think it's fabulous what he has done. And this is where he and I really get along perfectly, is this is his work, and I think this is genius. You know, I wrote a new equation for hydrogen based on golden ratio. That's my little claim to genius. But Nassim wrote this. Nassim said he corrected the mass of the proton. Physics, really, Einstein was a major screw-up in this. Strong and weak nuclear force was a major screw-up. Einstein was a screw-up. Poor guy, he did a few things right, but mostly he got it wrong. For example, the speed of light being a speed limit. Uh -uh. <laughs> no, and it's confused physics ever since. So Nassim picked, Nassim fixed part of Einstein's screw-up by correcting the mass of the proton, the Schwarzschild condition, you don't want to hear all this physics today. Go look at the videos. It's fun. So he fixed the mass of the proton to, to prove that the proton and everything in physics is literally a black hole. That is to say, the Schwarzschild condition, think of it as a, a vortex geometry. When the vortex is right, you get centripetal implosion. And physics called that a black hole. The definition of the word chem, as in chemistry and alchemy, and the original name for Africa, Egypt, Kim, and the place of the blackness, because the original pharaohs were blue-black, and that's a later story today. Anywho, so then, after fixing the mass of the proton, correcting the mistake of Einstein, then he says, oh, radius versus frequency of the Planck length, Big Bang, the atom, the solar system, the local galaxy, the big galaxy, and the universe, very, very, very accurate physics and putting them on a line, <laughs> they fit on one line. <laughs> Guess why? <laughs> because that the position of those events on that line are all golden mean ratio. <clears throat> so, phys so, uh, so Nassim says the scaling law for all organized matter is called phi, or golden mean relations. Hello? We're happy now. We get along real good. <laughs> that, that model is so fantastic because it shows compression. Exactly, it does. That's amazing. And, and I first learned of this, I have to say, a guy named Tom Sawyer, different Tom Sawyer, at University of Buffalo International Conference on Superconductivity, brought this made of, of stained glass, a model like this made of stained glass, and did a presentation saying this is the origin of superconductivity. It's really cool. And you know why? It's very simple. Because the spin path through center, the spin path through center in 3D, and this is what we needed to cover this morning. If, if, if I look now, when I jitterbugged that geometry, I got this. The infinite stellation of the dodeca ecosa, which is the top-down view of every living protein, and the top-down view of our core subject this morning this is, this is the focal image for everything we wish to discuss in science this morning, right there. That's it. I, I would like you to understand that this morning and why that creates centripetal force and why that is the origin of the list you asked about. This is the reason gravity exists. This is the reason color exists. This is the reason perception exists. This is the reason life exists. And I wrote a new equation to prove that this is precisely the actual physics of the shape of hydrogen, which from the side looks like this. And this is called phase conjugation or fractality. And here's my equation. It's so simple, but this is radical. This is implosive physics. Physics has to change its mind now. Hello, physics. You need to learn something. <laughs> this is the accurate, precise radii of hydrogen and they happen to be golden rain ratio. And I wrote a new equation showing the Planck length, which is the musical key signature of physics, period. So the musical key signature of all of physics is simple and clear. Physics absolutely knows what is sacred. There is no question. There is no subjectivity. It's very, very objective. The objective physics is that the Planck length, the Planck time, 
and the Planck energy are units which divide evenly into everything that physics has ever observed. So if you want to, you know, somebody says 528 hertz is sacred, bullshit, it actually isn't. And here's the proof, because it doesn't fit Planck length times golden ratio, or Planck time times golden ratio, and I wrote equations for that too. But we know what's sacred. Let me tell you how fun this is. This is just to give you an example of fun. Hi, welcome. <laughs> nice to see you. Hi, Marianne. So um, the fun story is my dear friend, recently deceased, John Michel, who wrote um, a lot of the early books on physics of, uh, on sacred geometry, uh, View Over Atlantis, City of Revelation, and they're very good. Um,